I was brought up believing in Kodak's law, which is if anything can go wrong, it will. So since then, I have always decided to carry a fusty flip chart with me. One or two people have commented that I have a rather strange relationship with flip charts, but I'm happy to live with it. Uh, anyway, very good afternoon to you. My name is Tim Fear, and I'm the director and co-owner with my lovely wife of the extraordinary coaching company. We work with entrepreneurs and the owners of small businesses to help them to find the hidden money in their business, and predominantly, it's pretty easy to find. I'm also scarred. As I stand before you, I've been scarred by two corrosive and destructive twins that pursued me in my young life. And they were talent and potential. Because when I was a young lad at school, um, that was what I was blessed with, so I was told. You're a talented young Tim. You'll find things easy, don't you? You're a very talented lad, loads of potential. And I bathed in the glory of potential and talent. I went, yes, absolutely, I agree with you. As I strode unflinching through exam after exam, leaving them dead in my wake as my results topped the extreme of excellence. And then something happened to me. I believe, I have never run a marathon, but I believe they call it hitting the wall. And I hit the wall because suddenly I found things difficult. And I didn't know what to do because I was talented with enormous potential. And yet, here was in front of me an obstacle through which I couldn't pass. It was difficult. Now, what would happen? Did I think to myself, what would happen What is, will happen if I tell people that I'm finding it difficult? I, the talented one, who, in the words of people around me, Tim, or in the words of my teacher, Fearon, because in my day we were always called by our surname at school. And I was at an elite school. I was at public school. Fearon, they said to me, dear boy, you have Oxford written all over you. Now, I don't know too many people in the world who have the names of the cities of England written across them, but nonetheless, it seemed that I had Oxford written all over me. So there I was bound for the dreaming spires, for the halls of academe, with all my talent and potential. And then I hit the wall. And the wall was a challenge for me. We walked into an area of learning that I didn't get. I didn't, I couldn't, and the exams, the stuff became harder, and I couldn't break through, and I couldn't tell anyone I couldn't break through, because what would they have thought of me when everything was easy? Can you imagine? He would strip me of my identity as talented. I would no longer be talented Tim. And so one day, I proudly announced to my collected family, I have made a decision. I am an adult, almost. I've made a decision. I've decided uh, I don't want to go to Oxford. And I didn't. And it is the single biggest regret of my life. So these corrosive and destructive twins have a lot to answer for. Because I've asked a number of people in the work that I do over the years, I've asked them, I've said to them, are you, how many of you, I've asked audiences, how many of you are achieving your full potential? How many hands have gone up, do you think? None. Because they have not an idea about what I'm talking. They don't know what their potential is. It's this thing everybody's supposed to have. Potential, I have potential. Potential for what? What kind of potential? How much potential? And then we get into the argument of degree. Are you more potential than that person? Are you more talented than them? And you hear parents stand at the sports ground, stand on the touchline as I do. Oh, I think my daughter's slightly more talented than yours. Oh, yeah. And we are breeding. We breed into our young people an idea to which they can never aspire. 
because they have no idea what they're trying to do until they hit the wall. The other side of potential, of course, and talent is that if you have it, if there is a positive, there must, must there not, yes, be a negative. So therefore, there will be people who do not have potential and are not talented. Let me introduce Floyd. Some years ago, I formed an organization to help young people between the ages of 16 and 18 who had what we would now term significant learning difficulties. But in those far more enlightened days, we stamped them with the badge of education is subnormal. Brackets, M, close brackets. Medium, oh, welcome. I understand you have a modicum of educationally subnormality. Welcome. And so these people, these young people, were sent to me and to my team and to our business, thrown out of the education system, pushed through it without it having had any noticeable effect on them whatsoever, and would arrive with us, and our job was to train them for the world of work. And I remember the first day that I met Floyd. He stood about this high. He was 16. I walked up to him. This is his first day with us. I, Hello, Floyd. How are you? And he looked at me, and he couldn't speak. He could not communicate. Illiterate. Innumerate. At the age of 16, and he could not speak to an adult. Let me fast forward a few weeks. I'm sitting in my office, and my office door bursts open. And there is Jerry, one of my team, a brilliant, brilliant man. And he said, he looked at me with excitement in his eyes. He said, Tim, I've got it. I said, what have you got? He said, I've got the key to Floyd. I said, what do you mean you've got the key to Floyd? He said, well, yesterday. He was so excited. He said, yesterday, Floyd was not feeling well. So I took him home in the car, I gave him a lift back to his place, and he was so grateful, he invited me to see his room. I said, I walked in, small room, and he said, and there, in that room, on the table, on the floor, were piles of magazines about motorbikes in the room of my little <laughs> illiterate and innumerate friend, Floyd. Now, you can probably see where this is going. So Jerry and his team put together a program of learning and education and development for Floyd based around motorbikes. And in six months' time, Floyd could tell you how much it would cost to travel from Brighton to London on a 600cc Yamaha. But you see, he had no potential, he had no talent, had no right to be able to do that. Corrosive twins that pursued him just as they pursued me. And so, what do I want to give you that you can take away from this? Besides the abhorrence of labeling, of looking at anyone, and giving them the permission to have talent and take it easy. Because that's what it does if you are not very careful. And the second thing I want to give you is the secret that I discovered worked with me and for me eventually and worked for Floyd. And finally, before I finish, and I am talking quite quickly, before I finish, I want to give you the seven keys to untold wealth. Would that be worth it? <laughs> yes. Yes, of course it would. Thank you so much. That means you'll probably stay now, doesn't it? So what was the thing that I noticed? What was it about, about what happened with Floyd that opened the gates to learning and understanding and education? And I am proud beyond measure to say that in that business 
we averaged out at 72% of our young people went into full-time employment. As did Floyd. Guess where? In a motorcycle car. Absolutely. Working on motorbikes. Because they combined two things for him. One was his desire and his passion. And we've heard about passion so eloquently this morning. And the second was something that I have noticed particularly and specifically in every single successful person that I've ever worked with, and they count in their thousands over these years, and that is the will. And it always reminds me when I speak of that of A.P. McCoy. Those of you who follow uh, racing, horse racing, will understand who I'm talking about. The greatest hurdle jockey of our time, probably of all time, and maybe even for the future, 3,662 winners to date. And in Great Britain alone, he has fallen off a horse 695 times. But ladies and gentlemen, he's got up 696 times. And when he was interviewed recently, he said, I am not the most talented jockey. It's just that I have the will. And so that's the thing I offer you. That's the secret that I offer you, which I've noticed is applicable to every successful and brilliant person that I've ever worked with. And so what I want to leave you with, because it looked like you were quite interested are the seven secrets to untold wealth, or the seven keys to untold wealth. And where have I found these keys, and where have I collected them from? I've collected them very simply from people. Because I had the opportunity in this country, and actually particularly and specifically in America, to work with some people who I would regard, and not in a boastful fashion, as some of the most successful entrepreneurs on the planet. And they all have these things in common. So let me give them this to you. The first is this. They know exactly where they are going. They have utter, utter clarity of vision about what it is they want to achieve and where they're going. The second key is that on a daily basis, they remind themselves of that. And the way they do it typically is to move to the future and stand in it and shower in it and cover themselves with it and dress in it and experience it so they know what it is like to be successful and to have the thing they want. The third key is they ignore. They ignore anyone who says they can't do it. The fourth thing is they make decisions quickly, spontaneously. And I was speaking to a great entrepreneur in this country. Some of you may have heard of him. Perhaps few of you have. His name is James Eder. Go and look him up. He has a business called studentbeans.com. I don't know if any of you guys... Yes, that's the man. He formed it some six, five, six years ago, the age of 21, as he left Birmingham University... In the first year he started it, he engaged 20,000 students, all from Birmingham in it. In the second year of launch, he launched it in 18 cities in the UK. They now have 600,000 separate visits every week onto the website. It is the largest student-attracting website in the UK. And he said, when I spoke to him the other week, he said this to me. He said, Tim... What I've noticed is that if we decide, and he's talking about the business, to make a decision, if we have not made it within 24 hours, the likelihood of us making it reduces to about 10%. I also have had the privilege to meet a very successful martial arts entrepreneur in America who has a, a whole stack of, uh, of uh, martial arts studios around the States and his is a slightly different take, but pretty much pretty similar. And he says, if I have an idea, and I haven't acted on that idea within 24 hours, I throw it away because it was clearly not worth it. 
So these people take decisions, they take them quickly and with purpose, and always those decisions head them in the direction of where it is they want to go. The fifth thing they do is they're dedicated to learning. And they stretch themselves and immerse themselves in the area of expertise until they are the world's expert. How many of you have read Carol Dweck? D-W-E-C-K, go and read it. Carol Dweck, Mindset. Read some of the stories there about the time people put in to become the very best. And that book, that book for me was, it, it was just so great because it, it told me everything that I had experienced was true about talent and about the corrosion that it can bring on. And so the sixth thing they do is they surround themselves with people who are like-minded. And one of them said to me some while ago, Tim, you will only ever be as successful as the five people who are around you. So they search out success. And each and every one of them, successful as they are, has another thing. As part of that, they have a mentor. Every single one of them, who is usually more successful than they are. Because that's how they move on. That's how they stretch themselves. And the seventh thing is that when they fall, they get up. As Shizura Arakawa would tell you, the Olympic ice dance champion would tell you that on her way to that illustrious prize, they believe in rough terms she fell over 20,000 times. But of course, as you know now, she got up 20,000 and one times. So I offer you those. I leave those with you. Take them, use them in the way that is most appropriate and beneficial for you. And on that note, thank you for your time.